my book, I, I, so I was working on this book for 18 years. There's a number of reasons why it took me so long to do this project about spiritualism. Right now, it's a very exciting time to be speaking about spiritualism. Uh, I don't know if um, you all are aware, but the Guggenheim Museum recently did a, a retrospective of the spiritualist artist Hilma of Clint, and it broke attendance records. It broke catalog sale records. There's a huge amount of interest in spiritualism right now in the art community. I'm going to explain a little bit why uh, in a minute. Um, but this was not always the case. And when I started my project, I actually was um, forced out of my graduate program because they told me that the topic was inappropriate for galleries. And um, But I continued on. And so now it's, it's just a lucky coincidence or, you know, the spirits are with me that I would um, compile this work at a time when people are more open to hearing about spiritualism and mediumship and afterlife studies. Um, this is a, a Hilma of Klimt work that actually appears in my book, um, the artist I just mentioned. And um, this book is one of the primary sources uh, many scholars use um, uh, when, in, during the study of spiritualism. And the author was uh, teaching at Harvard, and she writes in the preface of the second edition how um, her colleagues were horrified and um, not happy that she had chosen to, to acknowledge that spiritualism was a huge um, influence on women's rights. And so I want to use this to make the point that a lot of spiritualist history has been written out of textbooks and history books. And that was one of the one of the amazing things I discovered at when I first started my project and, and something that led me to do all the research that I did do. There's a number of essays in the book. The book is three parts. The first part are essays that frame spiritualism historically. And um, there was one by the artist, Tony Orsler. He's um, a famous artist here in New York, and he has a huge collection of spiritualist imagery. This is a William Mumler family album that he owns. He allowed me to uh, reproduce a lot of the art that he owns in, in this essay. Uh, this is of some spirit art that he uh, owns from Ethel Russ La Russignol, who uh, was a recently discovered spirit artist. Um, so he, these are all spirit art from his collection that I was able to use, and he writes about that. The second essay is from the curator who actually, um, he runs the Hans Bender archive in Germany. His name is Andreas Fischer, and he allowed me to use historical images as well, and some which have never before been published, uh, as this picture of Katie King. He actually curated the first spirit photography show, um, in contemporary times, it that was at the Met. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this book, but this is uh, what Andreas curated. This book, it's a great book if you haven't seen it. Um, so he allowed me to use these pictures, and in his text, he kind of frames my work historically and explains uh, why my project is unique in the history of spiritualist photography. These are all images, and so then I wrote my own text as well, kind of framing. Um, why I, why I did the project, why I became so interested, why it took me so long. I, talk, I, I tried to make the book for people who knew nothing about spiritualism or mediumship or art so that they could just start from the beginning and get, and get through it. Um, the, the second part of the book is 150 original images uh, that, from, that I've taken in the United States, in England, and in the UK. And I'll, I'm going to show more of that in a minute. Um, and then the third part of the book is a deep dive into every single photo. So, you know, there'll be my picture runs as a thumbnail, and then I'll, there's historical information, there's anecdotes, there's stories behind the stories. So, I, you know, here this is a spread talking about famous apports, the Skull Group, Helen Duncan. Um, here's one about Yuri Geller's time in Lilydale, uh, Mae West visiting Lilydale. I wrote a short history of the medium's cabinet. So that, I wrote 30,000 words that kind of contextualize uh, the work, and that's the third part of the book. But I want to start with how I got to this topic, and that is um, I grew up near Lilydale, New York, which is the world's largest spiritualist community. And when I was a teenager, my cousin went to Lilydale and got a message from a medium that described uh, accurate details about my grandfather's death that proved to be true, that uh, were part of this strange family secret about how he actually died. 
I became completely fascinated with how this total stranger could have known my family's uh, personal details and could have, could have reported them to her. And so I began photographing in, um, in Lilydale in 2001 when I, I was working as a photojournalist. So usually here, I mean, I, I know that I'm, I'm talking to a crowd who's very familiar with the history, so I'll try to get through this part really quickly. But I find that most people don't know anything about the history of mediumship or spiritualism or afterlife studies. So when I, I'm giving the, the, the talk that I normally do, so I tell about the Fox sisters and how they were the first American mediums and that uh, their actions kind of spread the movement across the world. The women's rights movement was heavily involved with spiritualism. I know everybody's from different countries, but in this picture, Susan B. Anthony is seated here at Lilydale because she used to spend summers there. And Susan B. Anthony is our most famous women's rights activist who helped women get the vote. And the first woman to run for president in the United States, Victoria Woodhull, ran as a spiritualist medium. And our American president, Abraham Lincoln, and his wife, Mary Todd, held seances in our White House in Washington, D.C. with senators and cabinet members. The laundry list of, of scientists who experimented with spiritualism is a mile long, including the Curies. The creative people who have experimented with spiritualism or partaked in seances or mediumship is long as well, including William Butler Yeats, who channeled several pieces, including this novel, through the mediumship of his wife. The Surrealists famously co-opted all of spiritualist techniques, but they just reassigned the agency to their unconscious rather than the spirit world. But they were, they were completely inspired by spiritualist actions. I spoke earlier about Hilma of Clint, and what is fascinating is art history is now accepting Hilma of Clint and other artists like Joji Aaron Houghton as the actual pioneers of abstract art. So that means that spiritualism actually gave birth to modern art. And the art historians are grappling with this now. Everything's being rewritten because of this. These women predate supposedly the father of abstract art, who's Vasily Kandinsky, by over 50 years. So it's, it's, it's causing huge ripples throughout all of our, all our hist history communities. I, I spoke on how I ended up there. My cousin went to one, a message service like this. This is an old postcard from Lilydale and received this message. And this is what drew me to the project. And I honestly thought I'd spend one summer making pictures about this quirky little town that was very unique, that was full of very interesting characters. And I did not foresee that it would take me 18 years. <laughs> this is Inspiration Stump, uh, my first picture there. So when I got to Lilydale, I didn't know anything about spiritualism. I didn't know anything about mediumship. I couldn't understand how you could be a sane person and still speak with dead people. But I was so curious and I wanted to learn everything I could about mediumship and about spiritualism and about trance states. And so I would just walk around the town and knock on doors and ask people, to teach me about spiritualism, and they did. They were very gracious about it. I'm very thankful for them. I would just wander around the town making pictures. This is a spirit. This is some spirit art that hangs in the hotel. Uh, this is by, behind the scenes of a message service. I would just, you know, make pictures of everything I saw. I didn't really know how to take pictures of spiritualism at first. Uh, this is healing, spoon bending. Uh, I also started photographing clairvoyant mediumship. I sat in on some readings. And then I started to go to seances. I, they were very rare at Lilydale that they do dark seances or even transfiguration. But I, I found myself in some of these situations and I became very frustrated with photographing them because they were difficult to photograph. I mean, how do you show the correspondence between a visible body, body and a veiled spirit? And this was a big you know, became a big problem. How do I properly photograph spiritualism? I began to have a few happy accidents with my camera. This is one of the first. I was in the Lilydale Museum and I was taking pictures and I was shooting film at the time and I got two frames with this big purple orb on this woman's body and it was in two different rolls of film, two different areas of the frame, but the same part of her body. So I printed the pictures and I, and I said, I've got these strange pictures. I don't know what happened here, but there's this purple orb. And she took the pictures and she looked at them for a long time. And she said, oh, that's Bob. And she, she meant it, it was the energy of her deceased husband. And um, before that, I had never thought that photography could speak to the metaphysical. It was kind of like my first happy accident. Uh, what I did discover also in that museum was that 
there was a spiritualist history of spirit photography. And I had never heard of spirit photography. I had studied the history of photography extensively, and these images were not in any of the textbooks I studied from. And I found them really confusing and absurd and outrageous and strange, but also very powerful and very tender. I particularly became interested of pictures of physical mediums and especially ectoplasm. I became completely fascinated and confused and curious about ectoplasm. And I wanted to decode these pictures. I, I wanted to understand what was going on. They were the most strange and uniquely disturbing images I had ever come across. And I had done a lot of photographic study at that time. So I wanted to figure out what ectoplasm even was. I didn't even know what it meant. And I think for, I don't know about everybody who's here, but for me, uh, the first time I heard the word ectoplasm was through the movie Ghostbusters. What I discovered is that Dan Aykroyd is actually a fourth generation spiritualist. This is, uh, he wrote the foreword for my book, and this is his actual family spirit photograph that was taken in Lilydale. His great grandfather uh, hosted mediums in Canada, including Conan Doyle, and his um, seance journals was actually were actually the inspiration for the movie Ghostbusters. Compl when I found that out, I was completely shocked by that. And so as an artist, I had seen images of ectoplasm in the art world. Like this is one that predates Ghostbusters, Poltergeist. This is one from Tony Orsler, the, uh, the man who wrote the essay for my book. And then even on South Park, they'll make jokes about ectoplasm. And so I, I wanted to make the point that there is a cultural awareness of ectoplasm that's totally removed from its uh, historical context. And so this painting by the visionary artist Pa LaFolie comes closest to clarifying ectoplasm's meaning with its, with its um, words, life, ectoplasm unites life with death. So, you know, ectoplasm is uh, taken from the Greek, ectos plus plasma, it means outside formed. It's a uh, supposed to be a paradox. It's a paradox. It's a substance that's supposed to be both spiritual and material at once. And it was, uh, the, the term was coined by a Nobel Prize winner in medicine, Charles Roche, who describes it as this material that it emanates from the medium and seems to come to life by itself. And so in the 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, there are very serious studies trying to prove ectoplasm and figure out exactly what it was. Scientists compared it to um, natural phenomena like plasma, spider webs, slime molds, chrysalis of caterpillars. You know, the, the parapsychologists that I speak to, they say that they're curious why it doesn't appear throughout the ages. It, it seems to, ectoplasm travels through the world as the photographs um, become available. And so then there are some people who studied ectoplasm who say, well, that's how the Catholic saints produce their phenomena. They use the visual of the painting and they meditate on it. And then, you know, uh, like Joseph of Cupertino levitated when he was looking at a levitation. Same with Catherine of Siena and her stigmata. Other, other parapsychologists have told me that they believe it's similar to um, shamanic healing practices where they use the phlegm of the body and that becomes like a healing substance. But the problem with ectoplasm is there's a lot of recorded fraud in seance rooms, including like the psychic mafia here that, that book, this book deeply describes uh, the mechanics of fake ectoplasmic seances. So what happened in spiritualism is most churches or circles are, they do what you most likely, I'm not sure if every, this, this television show, The Long Island Medium is really popular in the United States. So I use it as an example. It's saying most mediumship you see is just like you see on her television show. You're in a white room, just having a conversation. There's no lights off. There's no mediums cabinets. There's no ectoplasm. It's just pure mental mediumship for the most part. But what I found is that most of the spiritualists I met still believed in the reality of ectoplasm. And uh, so I became very interested if, if ectoplasm was still being produced in, in the world and if I could find it and um, how could I photograph it. So this question took me to the Arthur Finley College in Stansted, England, which um, I'm sure some people must be aware of this, but this place uh, for people who 
don't know anything about spiritualism, I always call it the Hogwarts for adult spiritualists, you know, to give them an idea. And the thing about Arthur Finley College is that it, they had always done ectoplasm seances uh, because their beloved principal, uh, Gordon Hagenson, was an ectoplasmic medium. So several times a year, even through when it became unpopular and, it, and when ectoplasmic seances went into the home circles, Gordon was still doing them at the college. And so I traveled there in 2003 and I took a physical mediumship course and um, it was Gordon's course. And they, it was kind of in a transition period because Gordon had passed away and they weren't sure if they were, should still keep the course going on because there was nobody producing ectoplasm, but they were still trying to teach us how to have a physical circle. So this is Gordon's um, cabinet. Uh, so Paul um, Jacobs was m one of my teachers and we spent a lot of time learning how to use a mediums cabinet. This was my seance classroom, that in the dark, singing to the spirits, um, asking for them to come and move the toys. And we each took a turn in the mediums cabinet and including myself. And we were told ectoplasm is very dangerous to produce and that um, all the protocols and how you have to be very careful with it. And um, so my joke is that uh, Paul was a very good tutor, but he was getting, uh, everybody in the class was getting frustrated because nobody was producing ectoplasm. And by midweek, Paul said, None of us had any ectoplasmic talent, and that um, he did, but we were, we were all such a bad group. Like, our vibe was just not, it's not going to make it happen for anybody. And so this woman, Sharon Harvey, who was in our class, she came in, when she was, she's a physical medium, and um, she came in and made a joke and all this tissue in her face and collapsed on the chair and said, oh, look, I've got some ectoplasm. And uh, that was as close as we got to ectoplasm during that week. So I became um, very frustrated photographing spiritualism and I didn't think I would ever find ectoplasmic seances. I didn't think I would ever be able to photograph any physical phenomena. I didn't understand how to photograph mediumship. I felt like I wasn't um, being psychologically true to the actual events with the photographs that I was making. And so I stopped photographing. I really believed that I would not finish the project, but I started doing a lot of reading and research. I started reading parapsychology, uh, a lot of different texts. I started reading about ancient mediumship. I, and I also discovered uh, the practice of instrumental transcommunication. And I, I think you've probably spoken a lot about this in your group on um, this type of work. I know Sherry Pearl does quite a bit of work with ITC. So, and I discovered the skull experiment and that was at the Skull Experiment and their use of uh, technology and their, the images, these are video stills from Skull, um, these are pictures from Skull, these are more um, photographic, uh, photographic seance material from Skull. The, the, the Skull was inspiring other spiritualists in England to experiment with technology and so there was all this new experimentation going on and happening. This is a skull device that appears in the book. And so, um, and then I just, so I found that there were people experimenting with technology and that also there was a new photography movement, like a spirit photography of today had, had evolved called orb photography. And I, I found that there was tons of writing and tons of experimentation and people were teaching techniques of orb photography and, um, having um, really fascinating results with orbs. And um, I found out that people were using, doing really interesting experimentation using water and electricity or selfies, their eyeglass selfies. Um, you know, I, maybe some of you have seen some of these works on Facebook and a lot of mediums photograph themselves and um, post their results on Facebook. So, and yeah, thermal cameras were being used. You know, so I, I thought, Spirit photography was a thing of the past, but what I found out in my research was, no, it was actually happening and that I could actually go and experiment with mediums who were using technology and it was something that was happening now. And this is a, a woman, um, Sylvia Howarth, who I've done quite a bit of work with. She does um, amazing spirit art and she videotapes herself in trance and she gets absolutely fascinating results. This is her. She made a camera obscura seance room. She does all kinds. This is her using... Um, an Xbox Connect camera and 
having it track her body. Then she goes into a trance and then she asks the spirit to interact with people in the room um, free of her motion. I became re-inspired and I started the project all over again or, you know, I, I picked up where I left off. I went back to Arthur Finley College and I started working with people who were doing using mediumship and technology. Yeah, I learned about a ghost box. This is a picture I took of the ghost box. The ghost box is one of the most fascinating things I've ever worked with. I've heard people get very sensical, exact answers to questions from a ghost box. And one time um, somebody asked it three times three and the ghost box said nine. Um, so yeah, so this is just part of the book became me working with these uh, practitioners who uh, were teaching me about technology and I started to do my own experiments. This is a water scrying experiment in Liverpool, England. Oh, I went to, into the mountains with a group of orb photographers in Italy and I told them, you know, I'm not going to get any orbs because I rarely, very, very rarely get orbs. I have um, a professional camera with a very large sensor and some of the theories about orbs is it's harder to get orbs with that type of a camera and I very rarely get them. And the, the experimenters said, oh no, if we go into the mountains and we say our prayers and we ask for orbs, you're gonna get orbs. And I got this picture, which is really astounding because as, as much you can zoom in and in and in and there's still orb upon orb upon orb upon orb and it wasn't raining and it wasn't a dust storm and there wasn't insects and I, not all my pictures came out like this. So this, this picture, I really love it because it's very mysterious to me as somebody who completely understands the technical side of photography. I, I don't know how it was made. This is a smoke scrying experiment outside a seance room. Uh, this is Loch Ness. Uh, I went to Loch Ness and I did an experiment by myself to see if I could get something um, that correlated with Loch Ness and I did. It's a smoke scrying. And so through the ITC experimenters, I began to relook at my early work that was like mistakes. And like this one, so when I took this picture, this is early on in the project, and I was very much intending to just make a straightforward image of a, we were, we were passing around trying a flashlight trying to do transfiguration. And I just wanted to make a straightforward picture of the woman holding the flashlight. Everybody in the room was saying, oh, we see a face that's right next to your face. It's you, but it's not you. Um, it looks a little bit like you. Maybe it's your doppelganger. Maybe it's your grandmother. Maybe it's, oh, maybe it's that voodoo priestess Marie Laveau. Like the people were seeing this face that was similar but different. And I didn't see a second face. But I got this film, this, I had was shooting film at the time and I got this perfect second face floating next to her face exactly as if as it was exactly what everybody was clairvoyantly seeing but weren't seeing like but you couldn't see with your eyes and so this synchronicity with the photographic accident I found it very compelling and very interesting it felt like something I should experiment with and so what happened was is through all of these this thoughts and this research I, I found also that more people were practicing physical mediumship all of a sudden. That was not the case when I began my project, but it was the case when I picked it back up and I learned, you know, and I became reinvigorated. And then all of a sudden I was finding physical mediums who were working and working very, like this is Mont Cabral, which was a center. Tom and Kevin were bringing people over and having groups come together for physical mediumship. I'm sure some of you have been there. So I started traveling all over to all the physical mediums I could find, photographing as much as I could. And so I tried to I use these images to describe physical mediumship to people who have never heard of it. And I say it's, it's everyone is unique. And it's a spiritualist, it's a serious, serious spiritualist ritual, but it's also very performative. And each of the mediums is like, they have their own style and their own way of presenting and their own way of doing things. And they use, they use different types of lighting. Some use complete darkness, some use red, blue, green light. Um, everybody has a different way of using music or working with music different objects that they bring into their seance room, different props. These are some glow-in-the-dark seance shoes that were used in Mont Cabral for one of the spirits. And then I encountered a lot of mediums who are um, going into trance and speaking as deceased celebrities. And I find that a lot of people find this aspect fascinating. 
uh, you know, people who don't know about spiritualism or mediumship, but they're very interested in like, oh, Louis Armstrong's very popular in seance rooms, Michael Jackson, Freddie Mercury. So, you know, in these travels, I was finding, I was, people would say that they were working with ectoplasm. I found that everybody seemed to have a different definition of ectoplasm. Like some people described ectoplasm as transfiguration as ectoplasm. Some said the ectoplasm was helping them heal people. Some said that, you know, the ectoplasm was like a force that worked on their body. In all of these seances, I, and, and this is a trans healing, actually, Kevin, but I got two Kevins, one with the eyes closed, one with the eyes open through long exposure. And so I became really open to the process of seeing what happened if I sat with my camera and put it on a tripod and, and did um, long exposures. So, and a lot of the mediums were telling me that the pictures I was getting were relating to what was happening to them with the spirit. Like, for example, this got this medium, Gordon Garforth, I took this picture and his wife said, oh, that's just a blurry picture. And he said, no, no, I see what's happening in this picture. They've been telling me that I'm going to have another face come off of my face through elongation. And so he saw this as like a prophesizing what's going to happen. So a lot of the pictures are me um, experimenting with the picture, with taking pictures of people who are in trance for physical mediumship. Ectoplasm should be in the room or is in the room somehow, but we can't, it doesn't look like the ones from the, the ectoplasm from the vintage images. So one of the really great things about the book is that when I started taking pictures, I wasn't doing interviews or I wasn't thinking about writing text. I had never even written, a, before this book, I had only written 1,500 words professionally. So the fact that I ended up doing all this writing and I did over 60 interviews. So I was able to go back and interview people I'd been working with for like 18 years, like this woman, Lauren Thibodeau. She's a medium at Lilydale. In the text, she talks about what it's like to be in trance and what she feels like when she's doing sitting for transfiguration. And so these are four images of Lauren taken at the same session of her in transfiguration. So they run in the book without any text, but then you can look up and, and read what Lauren is, says about her experience and about what she believes is happening to her body at this point. And then, yeah, like I was able to reconnect with people like the medium Sharon Harvey I mentioned earlier. And Sharon shared um, intimate details of her life story with me that I was able to put into the book. And um, this is one of my favorite pictures of Sharon. And what happened was, is I had, I had done photos of Sharon before and um, people were saying, oh, they're just blurry pictures, so they don't mean anything. And so Sharon said, what, don't, why don't you take some pictures of me, but don't make them long exposures, do as fast as possible. And I said, okay. So I, I was sitting with her in her seance room and I put my film speed up as much as I could. I put the shutter up as fast as I could. Um, I sat there and I made pictures. And then at one point her spirit guide said, we want you to take one picture, one long exposure, and we will show you our mask. And this is that picture. And so then I want to get back to the literal ectoplasm, like the, like the one that I, the ones I was showing earlier with the historical where you see it very dramatically. So um, I think the most, this is my opinion, but I think, uh, I think for me, the most controversial medium in the world right now is Kai Mugi. And why I say that is because the SNU um, is not a fan of his seances uh, there's a lot of people who do not like what he does, um, but he is very um, literally presenting ectoplasm in seances, a lot of times at, in Basel, Switzerland. Um, and so I had been in touch with Kai for a number of years, and then I finally in 2013 was able to meet him and photograph. And it was, I didn't know what to expect, but when, when he sat for seance, it was like, it was literal ectoplasm. It was ectoplasm like I had never seen. I was shocked by how it really was like the vintage images had like jumped to life right before my eyes. And Kai talks about ectoplasm as like a screen for projection and a place for the mind to put the inarticulated and that ectoplasm merges the world and its worlds, the realms of life and death um, brings together 
it's the ultimate face of the supernatural and it's where the visual of spirits can come through. And so um, for Kai, I just, there's an entire chapter about Kai and I interviewed him extensively. And so he's all in his own words describing his ectoplasm. This is a video I made of Kai in action, um, just so you get a sense of what it's like. I'll play it one more time because everybody usually asks me to play it twice. So with Kai, I said, Kai, what, what's the point of, because he travels all over doing these seances. I said, what is the point? And he said, there's two reasons. One is that ectoplasm has healing powers. And just, just by the act of trying to bring it about is healing. Like trying to bridge the, the realm of life and death in any way brings about healing. But ectoplasm is particularly, if you sit with an intention for ectoplasm, brings about healing. And then he said the second reason was to get people out of their own heads. And he says, we're not trying to make anybody believe anything in our seances. We're just happy if they have a, um, a thought outside of their normal thought pattern um, during our seance. And so what happened was is shortly after I first photographed Kai, that he was being studied by a number of parapsychologists. One of them is Stephen Brody. And there was in 2014, a number of papers were released accusing Kai of um, all different sites, sorts of fraud. You can look it up and research it. They're, the papers are all uh, published and they're all online for free. That One of the accusations was that Kai went on eBay and bought all this uh, haunted house spider web material and Kai said he bought it to make a video to show how different it looked and there was all this back and forth and it was very, there was so much drama and so I thought, what is going to happen? Like, Will Kai stop his seances? Is this the end? Like, is he so fat? Because he said he was done being studied. And But what happened was, and many of you, if you follow his work, may know that soon after, he started posting images of full materializations. And this is something that has not happened. Uh, images of such things have not happened in maybe 100 years. Um, I, and so I, I had to, like, follow up with Kai and um, in the book I was I was able I'll leave it I'll leave it as a cliffhanger I did end up going to a materialization seance with Kai and there was a there's a big long involved story about what happened but um, the story and the images and Kai's images are all in the book um, in chapter seven and so I'm going to end now with some of the images of the the strangest experiences I had photographing and these were with the mediums, uh, Gordon and Gaynor Garforth from England. And so Gordon, they're both um, longtime spiritualists. Gord, uh, Gaynor's father was a transfiguration medium. Gordon, when he was five years old, was told by the famous medium Estelle Roberts that uh, he would be a medium one day. And so the, he doesn't sit in a cabinet. Uh, one of his spirit guides is Jack Weber, who also didn't sit in a cabinet. So this is Gordon's seance setup. And so when I first met Gordon, he says, oh, well, you know, the spirits, they elongate my, you know, they, they use ectoplasm to manipulate my body and they elongate my limbs and um, things happen with my face and my hands and my arms. And um, I didn't know what to think because sometimes mediums tell me I'm going to see something and then I don't. And so I didn't really think much of it. I was just, I just went not expecting much. And so during this seance, 20 minutes in, Gaynor announces, because she's a circle leader, and she says, okay, they're going to start working with his hands right now. And so, and I was maybe six feet away. And then the next thing I know, I see this absolutely gigantic hand appear out of nowhere. And it, it wasn't like it, he put out his hand and it was like a regular size hand. And then all of a sudden it just jumped into this gigantic form right in front of my eyes and I had no idea how he did it and it wasn't a glove like people say oh that's a glove that's obviously a fake hand it it wasn't I could see clearly enough that it wasn't and so I actually screamed which I know is a very impolite and rude thing to do during a seance but I was so shocked I couldn't help myself and then everybody else started like rumbling and scream and like like oh my gosh too and I thought are they just screaming because I'm screaming or do they see this big hand? And then I was so terrified or like, not terrified, but I was so shocked um, that 
I convinced myself that I hypnotically rendered the big hand and that in my pictures, I would have a regular size hand and that it was, it was just all like, a hypnotic experience but then when I got my pictures back there was this very gigantic hand um, just as just as big and as imposing as I had seen in real life and um, so and now with the last um, so um, Gordon did a uh, when, I, when I was with him the first time we were at the Arthur Finley College for, with the friends of Stansted Hall and he did an impromptu. He was talking about trance, and then he decided to do an impromptu trance. So this is this session was just under a, like a little green security light. So they're like the longest exposures I've ever done. And he said that Jack Weber, you know, um, the famous medium Jack Weber, is his spirit guide and controls when his masks come out. And so he said he was going to do some masks that of transfiguration over his face. And so I took a bunch of pictures. And in every picture, Gordon looked a little bit different. And, you know, I mean, he looked dramatically different from he do, from the way he does in life, and he looked different from each picture. And so when I was going through the pictures, and he liked a lot of them, there was this picture, and I said, oh, gosh, I don't want to – I didn't even want to show him this picture because I felt like it was a little bit scary. And um, I didn't like the mustache. It reminded me it was a little too Hitler-esque. And so I was not, I was just going to throw this picture out and he saw it on my laptop and he said, oh my gosh, that's the picture. And I was confused and I didn't understand why. And so I just put the picture on a thumb drive and gave it to him. I didn't ask him anything. He didn't say anything. And then six months later, I went to his house and he said, oh, I have to show you something. And he brought out this card of visite of his uh, great grandfather. And so it's just, for me, this is how I end the book. Mm -hmm. because it's the strongest photographic synchronicity I've ever encountered. And um, Gordon believes that it was his grandfather transfigured over and that my camera caught it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that's, I think that's it for the book.